my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight and, and to introduce you to, and to reintroduce many of you to Professor Richard Verdi, who um, was director of the Barber Institute when I arrived in Birmingham 12 years ago. And I didn't know Birmingham very well and was walking around actually prior to my interview for this job. Uh, Richard Sawson is here. He was on the board at that time. And I was sort of getting a lie of the land. And I stumbled across the Barber Institute. And I, I, it was, my breath was taken away by the, by the, the, the beauty of it. It's, it's, um, it's elegance and it's seriousness. And I thought, well, if this is the kind of thing that, that happens in Birmingham, then it must be all right to live and to work here. And, and it, it was the achievement of uh, Richard Verdi, really, that had impressed me so much. I mean, somebody who had done so much for the arts and art history in Birmingham had made the Barber Institute and its amazing collection accessible to people in a way that it hadn't been before. Working with rigor and uh, a lively interest in art of all kinds, contemporary art, and I think that's something, too, that you know, really impressed me when we finally met how interested in living artist Richard was. And it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, a kind of a fusty, dusty, uh, you know, museum person that I was, I was with. It was somebody who was so kind of alive to the sort of ideas that also inform our program here at ICON. And we like to think, but we aspire to the condition of, of your achievement at the Barber. I mean, that, that uh, seriousness on the one hand and the accessibility that you achieved on the other. So it is, I mean, it's a personal, uh, it's a kind of personal uh, joy, a dream come true for me to be in front of you talking to Richard Verdi. Now I, am, I, I, you know, I think it is going to be difficult for me to get a word in edgeways. So I'm sort of getting, <laughs> getting uh, my sort of soliloquy over with first. I asked Richard a few months ago if, if uh, he would be happy to, to join us here and protested not too much because obviously he's here and you did agree and Richard what was it in the end that that um, that got you to say yes to you to me or to us close friendship and collaboration over so many years and the respect I have for everything you do <laughs> um, oh, it's, oh it could get a bit well, icky, it? it's true I mean the John Salt exhibition is a good example of the high standards that the icon constantly sets itself and achieves. Mm. And so uh, I was always very proud to be associated with the icon, as the barber very much was in those days. And, um, and so that's, I suppose, why I said yes too. I wish I hadn't, because it was <laughs> Cause very now here you are. Your nerves, I, you know, I, the stage fright, but I'm sure you're going to overcome it. And, and when, it came to, when it came to selecting eight works, eight paintings, in fact, uh, you didn't find that very easy? No. Because eight's I not very many. I can't tell you how many lists I drew up. Mm. Many. And when it came down to it, how did you distill all of the, all of the work that you're interested in to these eight? Well, they're very really personal choices, pictures I absolutely couldn't live without and would die for, and works of art which I honestly can say that the museums in which they're housed are for me shrines, mm -hmm. um, and I tend to go to them for that one work, or in the case of one museum, two works, um, and almost to the exclusion of <laughs> everything else that's there, although I know what else is there. And so they become kind of pilgrimages, mm -hmm. basically. And I do them in rotation. I've done them over 50, 40, 50 years in rotation. I keep doing it. What, what interests me uh, is the sequence in which they occur that you'll see. Uh, you know, when I asked Richard, you know, why are they in this order? Your answer was, well, because I'm an art historian. And we start with the, <laughs> we start with the earliest one. And we wind up with the most recent one. Yes. I'll just put them in chronological order. 
So that's how they are in art history. But as you know, I have an interest in delving into uh, the, the personal history of my subject. So I'm going to sort of dart about in the life and work of Richard Verdi as at the same time we analyze the, uh, if you don't mind, the, um, <laughs> the, the works on the screen. So the first one is uh, Grunewald. Yes. Uh, the Isenheim altarpiece in the Colmar Museum. I last saw this in 2002 with the Friends of the Barber. I spent an afternoon in front of it. It was about the fourth or fifth time in my life I'd seen it. And I just quietly muttered to myself as we were leaving that it must be the greatest picture in the world. And in some ways, I would absolutely stand by that. I cannot remember when I've been so unbearably moved by an image of death and grief. And by the way, the eight works I've chosen, quite by chance, all stand for very different aspects of human experience. And that is by chance, but this is death. Mm. We begin at the end. Um, and the altarpiece was painted, believe it or not, as a cure for hospital patients who are all suffering from horrendous skin diseases, St. Anthony's fire, leprosy, gangrene, and it was meant as a kind of miracle cure. The most horrific portrayal of the dead Christ you could imagine, and the most unutterably poignant image of the Virgin pallid with skin tones the color of her own son on the cross and dressed very extraordinarily in white not a normal red and blue undergoing a kind of sympathetic death with him the grief stricken Magdalene thrown to her knees at the foot of the cross is all so simple, so stark and so grave. And there seems to be not a note of hope in it except that signal by the Baptist, who shouldn't be there anyway, mm -hmm. of the right. He was long dead when Christ was crucified. And nestled in his arm is the inscription, he would increase, but I must decrease. And as you look, in Latin, of course, as you look at it, you realize that Christ is already increasing in size inordinately over all the other figures in the altarpiece. And somehow his victory over death becomes his very stature and awesome sight and size in the painting itself. Silhouetted against this stark nocturnal background it all has such an immediacy and force. I never think of it just as a painting. I think of it as a kind of tidal wave. And I can't think of another work of art in the world that disturbs me so much. It doesn't heal, it doesn't console, but it moves you unbearably. When was the first time you saw it? In the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And you were, where were you then? Were you I was in at London? York University. Right. Um, I've made periodic pilgrimages, about four, I should think, to Isenheim, and I'm afraid I suggested to the friends of the barber that we must go, and that was selfish. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see it again. Anybody in the audience was part of that? Yes, there are. <laughs> I mean, of course, the setting is very important, and, and you asked us to, to provide also an image of the work with the various panels and the predella at the bottom. Well, it's the, the entire composite altarpiece, it's a transforming altarpiece that was open on different occasions is ten different, ten separate panels, and the horrific treatment of Christ in the crucifixion scene is countered by the most radiant 
portrayal of him in the resurrection in the next stage of the altarpiece. So the transformative power of the altarpiece in terms of its original hospital patients would have been plainly visible to them. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it is, it is a very harrowing way to start, and, and sorry. And <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, the next artist has such a different style, mm. and there's something so much more sensual about this one. Well, this is death, the next one is love, so it's the opposite extreme. I absolutely adore Rubens, always have and always will. I think he's the most universal of all painters. There's no subject he can't excel at um, and didn't excel at. And the Garden of Love in the Prado, painted at the end of the life, is a hymn of joy, exuberant and exultant to the power of love mm. by a man who was experiencing it for the second time in his life. His first wife died of the plague in 1626. Um, he remarried in 1630. Um, Helena Fourmont, a woman 20, uh, 37 years his junior. And by his second wife, he had four children, one of them born eight months after his death. That's how much he was in love to the very end. <laughs> and this picture is a celebration of the stages promise and sheer joy of human love um, by a man who felt it, lived it, and also knew all of its many manifestations. In the center of the picture, you have a collection of very, very eligible and expectant females, all being promised future happiness by Cupid's and Putti and a musician um, serenading them with the promise and prospect of love. And then to either side, and this is where Rubens, the astute observer of human nature, you have two couples. On the right, a woman bedecked in silvery satins, um, brandishing a triumphal feather fan and leading her suitor down the stairs like the lap dog that he so obviously is and <laughs> has between his legs. Obviously, we know who's going to rule the roost in that relationship. And on the opposite side, and this is the really heartbreaking moment in the whole picture, the one that I could so easily take away on its own for myself. Mm -hmm. This is where all of Vato comes from. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, a woman who looks very like Rubens' second wife, Helena Fourmont, who's just gently being nudged, embraced, coaxed, and to whom the word has just been spoken and who is considering it in her own time and heart. And in that group alone, all the promise, prospect, and poignancy of love is enshrined, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's an ultimately a very, very happy, hopeful, and ecstatic picture, but it is still tinged with a sense of the fickleness of the human heart. Mm -hmm. It's a, I mean, it's a work. I mean, you, you, talk, you talk about this work so tenderly, and you referred prior to, prior to this evening to your trip to the Prado and seeing it uh, for the first time. Can you talk about that? that I mean, because you went, to, you went there and, were, and you sort of fell in love. I went there for another of the pictures on the list, and I'm sure there will be those in the audience who might guess what that was, or is, um, but the Prado has 150 Rubenses. This was bought by Philip IV from Rubens' um, posthumous sale, and that means that the artist kept it 
as his own private possession because, of course, it celebrated what was his own greatest achievement in the last decade of his life, in human terms. Um, and when I saw this in the Prado for the first time, I was just, oh, it's painted with such love, you know. That's the thing about Rubens. He embraces humanity so warmly. And I just went crazy over that. The richness of the color, uh, the sh splendor and beauty of the whole thing, just, come, I'm afraid, mm. just took me over. And the Prado and Madrid, Spanish Well, life. the Prado is obscene. I mean, it must be the greatest gallery in the world mm -hmm. in terms of the number of masterpieces under one roof. And again, when, when was this in your life? Are you a student? When you come across this the was the late 60s. I just was in my first lectureship in Manchester. Mm -hmm. And it took me two, three days to get from Manchester to Madrid by train. It was a difficult journey in those days. You, um, you know, prior to your teaching in Manchester, you were at the Courtauld. Yes. And the, uh, the next work, in fact, was the subject of your doctoral thesis. Oh. This is Nicolas Poussin. You shouldn't be doing this to me. No. Now, now, I want to talk... We've had death, we've had love, now we have the mind. Can I, can I ask you a personal question? You wound up in London at the Courtauld, but you're not from the UK. No. I can hear it in your voice. I mean, what's, what, what, uh, what brought you to this place? To the I got a fellowship to study with Anthony Blunt and to do my PhD on Nicolas Poussin with him. Mm -hmm. and, and I stayed. And how was that? How was it working with him? This is the infamous. Difficult. Uh, Anthony Blunt. Very difficult. Uh -huh. um, he was otherwise engaged with the Queen's pictures or other activities. Well, that's right. And, um, and you had in your, I think you had in, was it in, the, in the same year, you had uh, another um, remarkable person in uh, Brian Sewell. Yes. Um, Good. Well, it was a hotbed <laughs> of activity, the court of <laughs> in those days. But my passion was Poussin, and I stuck to it. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and then you made that amazing exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1995. Yes which was the first time I sort of took Poussin seriously. Richard and I don't agree uh, on a lot of things, but in the nicest possible way. I love Monet. He loves Manet. That's true, isn't it? Yes. I mean, you think, well, Monet, more, is, you think Monet is incredibly lightweight, uh, and I think he's a, sort of, you know, a, a, a genius of uh, visual things. And you, have a, and you have a very intellectual, I mean, you, the, I mean, on the one hand, though, I mean, there's this, such a, such a loving and passionate description of, of Rubens, but there is strong taste for, for intellectual and philosophical work. And Poussin is falling into that category. Not so sensual. Poussin craved order, and so do I. Um, he found it more easily than I can. And, or if he didn't find it, he made it. And this landscape in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool is one supreme example of his ability, astounding ability, to create the most intricate and complex construction and composition in which everything is welded together, everything fits together seamlessly into the most magnificent, dense, and yet lucid order. Um, I confess that more than loving Poussa, more than loving almost anyone, I love Bach. Mm -hmm. And this is the nearest I can get to it in art. Um, Bach is much more than just order. Um, but one thing he is absolutely about is that. And when Poussin 
can take a group, a, a, a landscape of mountains and rocks and buildings and trees and knit them together so seamlessly, both across the picture and into depth, so that the whole thing looks like, well, the temple in the center looks like a jewel in a surround. Um, it's got such a fastidious sense of precision and finality. It's one of these pictures where you couldn't touch anything without disturbing the equilibrium of the whole. Mm. And we don't have any drawings for it. We don't know how he painted his landscapes. On the whole, we have no drawings for them at all. We know that he apparently brought back leaves and twigs and stones and bits of broccoli from the countryside and mucked them up in the studio. But that cannot account for the splendor and discipline, uh, which is almost superhuman, of something like this. What about him as a man? Do you know much about his personal life? Yes, and he too said, well, I quoted him or paraphrased him at the beginning, he craved order. He said, my nature uh, insists on finding order in everything I see. And this is proof of it. Of course, he could never find that order in nature, but he could make it in his head. And my God, the cerebral power, but there's also great passion a passion for perfection, which I'm afraid always knocks me out. So you refer to music, to, and Bach, I mean, I've, I've been to see Richard at home, and you know you have an awful lot of Bach, and I sort of, I've, I mean, I imagine you by yourself, almost with your eyes closed in an armchair listening, you know, to one this happens CD occasionally. after another. And I was really impressed, I mean, this is on a much lighter note, when we made the Onkawara exhibition of the date paintings downstairs, he's a Japanese artist, and all he does uh, for his paintings is write the, the date on which the painting, of the day on which the painting was made, and we had them in a chronological order, so it was a very ordered and organized exhibition, and I was amazed by your reaction to the work. You could tell me what was number one in the top 40 in each of those years. So it's not just classical music you like. You have, I'm now blowing your cover. That's you have, a, you uh, you have cover. a strong interest in pop music too. Had. <laughs> Very complex personality. The next, the next work is another extraordinary sort of aesthetic uh, achievement. And we go back to, we're leaving Liverpool and we're going back to Madrid. Well. This speaks for itself. When was the last time you saw a work of art that looked, well, a picture that looked like it was a dress rehearsal for, for a picture, mm, mm. if you know what I mean? Um, if Poussin was the mind, this is the eye, and no one had a shrewder and more penetrating one than Velasquez. Here's a painting 10 and a half feet high that is, no snapshot, two centuries before the camera was invented, showing all members of the then royal family, Spanish royal family, the Infanta Margarita in the center and her parents reflected in the mirror for the fourth and Queen Mariana. And they look as though they're just suffering into position to pose for a, a group or family photograph. Um, the spontaneity the candor, mm. the instantaneity, the felicity of it. It looks like a blown up oil sketch uh, by Degas, <laughs> you know, but this is two centuries before Degas, three, um, no, two. And uh, Velasquez is extraordinarily shrewd and canny sense of capturing the instant. Most pictures, the vast majority of works of art, the Grunewald with which we began, or the Poussin we just left, tell you that they are paintings. 
this one ref defies, it, ref it redefines painting as the accident that happens also to be a picture. Mm. But it's so much about art making too, isn't it? I mean, it's so, I mean, on the one hand, it's so, it's so clever in its self-reference, and yet you don't, you, you, know, you don't feel sort of caught up in something which is self-indulgent. No. No, and the one thing that you can't appreciate just from a reproduction is the astonishing technique. Almost every other artist you know has a handwriting. We all have a handwriting. We all know that there are such things as handwriting analysts who can tell you who wrote what. And most art historians can tell you who painted what from the brushstrokes alone. With Velasquez, no two brushstrokes are ever the same. There is no personality there. Deliberately, he rethinks every passage in the painting so that it constantly looks like wizardry, like conjuring. It just doesn't look like marks on a surface. And certainly, it never looks like the same marks on the surface. Um, this, I, must be the, this must be the greatest painting as a painting that there is. So if when I get, to, if I got to, if I got to the end, if I got to the no, end, no, it won't be this. If I, if I said, what will you take to your desert island? You won't. Mm, no. Well, uh, we'll leave that. I hand. couldn't we'll live that with hand, that. Shall we? The Could figure be. in the, the figure in the doorway. That's so smart. I mean, it's a painted figure in a frame. The palace marshal. It's, it's that's such a stroke of genius. I think. Yeah. So this amazing use of light in uh, Velasquez, and then, well, there's oh. probably, actually the next two paintings, I was just about to say, the, a master of light coming up, but then there's another one. Oh. This. I just saw this last month, and I went to see it. Um, I saw other things while I was there, of course. What a humane way of being interrogated. Mm -hmm. The Velasquez and the Rembrandt, syndics of the Draper's Guild, are extraordinary because, well, in so many ways, they could never have known one another or of one another, but they turn painting inside out because Las Meninas and the syndics are pictures not that you look at, but pictures that look at you. And I sat for an afternoon in the Rijksmuseum, 17th of June, in front of this, and I felt unnerved because it was almost as though I was being asked to respond. Mm. It's a meeting of the officiating body of the Amsterdam Clockmakers Guild. Rembrandt probably knew them all a bit but no more than that. And he struggled a lot over the picture. X-rays show that as so do the drawings. He can't have known them well as human beings, and yet the warmth, the profundity, the spirituality even that he uncovers in humanity. If Velasquez was about the eye, Rembrandt is about the heart and man. Um, the individual sitters are so sensitively portrayed, so warmly portrayed. Rembrandt's humanity is deeper and wider than that of, I think, any other artist I know. Um, we all know, we should know, that when we look at a portrait, we're really seeing the painter, not the sitter. Mm -hmm. And, and that's so obvious when you look at a Van Gogh or, or someone like him. With Rembrandt, you feel that you're confronting a very, very great, rich, and profoundly understanding human being mm. whose depth emotionally, spiritually, as a person is that to which the rest of us can only just aspire. Um, I don't know what it must have been like to know him. The documents we have are not particularly 
interesting, and they're not revealing of the man much. But the the, the, the sympathy that he f- seems to feel and project onto his fellow human beings is boundless. I think one of the most extraordinary uh, things in art history is uh, his self-portraits. Yeah. You know, and you talk about this sort of interrogation of us, but this, you know, do you imagine him looking in a mirror or confronting... Interrogating the himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they are such an amazing achievement. And, and the, That's the, how he got to know mankind, mm-hmm. through himself. What were the circumstances? Because I, uh, you know, I, honestly, I mean, this isn't my, this is not my period. Um, how, what were the circumstances when he died? Was he, was he famous? He had Happy. founded the greatest school of, of history painters in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands, and they flourished right into the end of the 17th century. But he died impoverished completely. That's what he I was thought. bankrupt. And why? In why was 1656? Mismanagement. Loss of favor, loss of commissions. This was a rare late commission, but the commissions certainly do dwindle after the night watch in 1642. And um, he was a spendthrift, and he was declared bankrupt in 1656, and his studio was completely cleared and confiscated. And everything was turned over, his business activities, such as they were, turned over to his son Titus. Um, He died financially derelict, and also humanly. His son predeceased him by a year. His wife died very early on in 1641, and his mistress, Henry Stoffels, in 1663, and he had still six years to live. So he died alone. It's, I mean, you mentioned Van Gogh before, and this is... Not in the same breath with him, please. But the... (laughs) But the... But, you know, Van, I mean, Van Gogh is one of the, you know, he's the artist who makes the, the paintings itself for the most amount of money now, and yet there was somebody who, who died unappreciated and, and, and desperately. I mean, it, isn't, it, isn't it tragic, you yes. know, that these figures that we, you know, subsequently revere, and they are, you know, epitomes of, of what is humane and good. Well, Van Gogh struggled in his own lifetime a great deal too. Um, but the art market and the whole method of marketing art in the early 20th century was such that, and Van, De, Van Gogh's stature, of course, too, and his achievement, uh, was such that um, he would make these phenomenal prices. But Rembrandt now does too, but mm-hmm. in his lifetime he certainly didn't. He went out of favor, and there's no doubt that his style was considered, considered probably too too penetrating, because everything about Dutch portraiture that you know from the second half of the 17th century suggests that people wanted efficient face painting, but they didn't want the artist to probe too deeply, and he does. We're still in the Netherlands for the next work. This is, and I said it would, you know, we're, we're in the, you know, wonderful rooms filled with light. I'm also just trying to sort of come to some kind of conclusion halfway through. And then, in fact, it'd be really interesting to have, uh, to have um, your reference to the selection. But I'm just going to throw sort of an observation in here. We don't have any Italian work. We've got a lot no. of work. We have a lot of we more than work. We don't have any Italian work, and I know why. <laughs> the no Leonardo here. No, or Titian, or Raphael, no. and adore, or why? Donatello, and I adore them. Why um, not? But, well, I'll tell you, I think, why, but I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I better be careful about this. I am 100% Sicilian, and maybe that's why there are no Italian works, because that is temperamentally something I know too well. So this and is you confronting difference. This kind of coolness mm. I know much less well. <laughs> I don't know why the foreigners have always attracted me more, but they have. Um, 
Caravaggio, Titian, Raphael. Leonardo. All those German romantics. I adore the... Um, but in the end, well, I've just, I had to choose eight. And this was the first picture I fell in love with. Um, now, we, we are in we're Vienna. Back, we're, we're in Michigan now. Oh, are we? we well, I, well, no, we're in Vienna. <laughs> the picture's in Vienna, but I wasn't. Um, How old were you? 18, How old were you when you fell 18, in love? I was and I bought, I loved it so much that I bought a pullover with black and white stripes on the back. <laughs> if you want to know. This is exactly what we want to know. <laughs> but Vermeer is like Velasquez, one of the absolute magicians, conjurers in art. This picture is about art, and there's no god I worship more than the artist. Um, and this is what Vermeer is celebrating in this most autobiographical of all his paintings. It, it is probably him, but all we can say is we know what his back looked like. Looked because like, there's no, like there's my, no self-portrait. There's no. 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 Um, there's a picture in Dresden that might portray him, but we're not sure. But it probably does. But he's painting, and Vermeer was even more impoverished than Rembrandt, if that's possible. His wife sold his pictures to pay, well, she gave away his pictures to pay baker's bills after his death, literally, literally. Um, uh, he's painting Clio, the muse of history, who is holding a trumpet, traditional symbol of fame, and blowing it towards an open window. And it's exactly that part of the female figure, the laurel wreath, personification or symbol of fame that Vermeer has actually committed to canvas in the picture that you see, as though it is a guarded plea for the fame of his creations after his death. Something he certainly never enjoyed in his life. How, where does this sit in his career? Are we sort of we're somewhere in the middle? Sorry? Not, where does this sit in his career? This isn't a late... Uh, in his career, yes. it's uh, at the end, well, this, it's only a 43-year long life. It's at the end of the 1660s. He lit, died in 1675. Um, but, um, so it's, it's late-ish. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it's his second largest picture, and it's obviously a personal statement. A plea, dare I say it, with the map of the Netherlands hanging on the back wall mm. for the enduring fame of his creations after his death. Something that he had serious cause to wonder and worry about, uh, given his total lack of earthly success. Mm. Tragic. Only 32 pictures, um, no reputation. His reputation sank into complete obscurity and oblivion in his own lifetime and thereafter, he was only rediscovered in the middle of the 19th century and then by you, accident. Yes, I mean, how, how was he recovered? I mean, his reputation recovered? Well, the pictures in the end spoke for themselves, but when people read the monograms, the end, they thought it stood for Van Mieris, who was all very popular. Mm. George III bought Van Mieris all the time. That's why the greatest Vermeer in this country is in the Queen's collection. It was bought as Van Mieris. Mm. Vermeer amazing. wasn't known. Um, he was only discovered by the French. The Impressionist generation realized that Vermeer's eye was the most probing and penetrating. They discovered Vermeer and Velasquez mm. at exactly and we were talking about Bach earlier. Of course, I mean, I was, to me, who, I was wondering who was his Mendelssohn, because, of course, Bach also was, you know, out of, out of the picture for it, such a long well, time. Well, in the case of Bach, of course, because so much of the music wasn't printed, wasn't, you know, just wasn't known. Mm. And the, with Vermeer, there are only 32 pictures, and um, the, one English critic who saw his work in his own lifetime, John Evelyn, said there was not, nothing going on in them. And that's true, there isn't. But that's what's they, they don't tell stories, thank God. Uh, art is not a f visual form of literature. This is, I mean, it's such a smart, it's such a clever painting, isn't it? I mean, the, the drawing to one side of the, of the curtain, and then the light coming it's in so from the It's so reticent, so 
is. So, uh, but, but with Vermeer also, you've got to see originals and then look at the technique. Looking at the view of Delft and The Hague just a couple of weeks ago, the paint, you don't know how it got there. It looks as though it seeped through from the other side of the canvas. Mm -hmm. it, there is no, it's like a, de a deposit. It's not, it's not a, a manual action. I can't wait for you to see. We, we, at Icon in three years' time, we're showing the work of a Norwegian artist whose name is Peder Bauka. Same, around the same time as Dahl. And Richard is responsible for the acquisition of the amazing painting, the little Dahl in the Barber. Institute, but uh, Balka is almost as if he breathed on the canvas. It's so thin, you know, and then smears it off. Vermeer's impersonality. I'm fascinated by self-effacement. Mm. I just fascinated people who are and yet pretend that they're not. Mm. And Velasquez and Vermeer are the great sphinxes in art because they seem to deny the possibility that they could express anything personal, anything about themselves through their painting. They're just ciphers. Interesting, talking in front of John Salt, you know, as that's being said. I mean, here's somebody who is also, I mean, personally and aesthetically, very self-effacing. Photography, photography. The next work, I mean, then there's something very telling about this jump, because... You know, look where we are. We're with Cezanne. Well, You've missed out all the pre-Raphaelites. I can't understand Oh, it. God, shut <laughs> You've missed out all those water lilies. <laughs> I've come to the right place. <laughs> yeah, a more intellectual artist. Well, if Vermeer is about art, Cezanne is about nature. Um, this is La Domacy in the Courtauld Gallery, which it was very difficult to choose a Cezanne. He is my favorite of all painters. Not because I think he's the greatest, but because more than any other, he shows you how difficult it is to be a painter and still creates masterpieces. And the difficulty he sets himself, he's the last great artist to work from nature and to try to find in nature both its infinite richness and variety, and also its underlying order, and rigor. And this is a perfect example. The blueness alone unifies the entire scene. And then you see him struggling to rest cohesion. Now, we saw this with Poussin, but Poussin did it, did it up here. Cezanne is doing it here. He visited the Lac de Saint-Ancy in 1896 on the border between France and Switzerland. And you see him focusing on the tree trunk on the left, the chateau at the other end of the lake, the others in the middle, and the house on the distant right-hand shore. And using those three focus points around which to order and organize this torrent of brushstrokes um, to convey the inimitable and overwhelming richness, range, and variety of color in nature. Um, the picture is rapturous with his excitement about what he's seeing and feeling before nature. How much is he painting outside? I should think virtually all. There is a watercolor for this picture, which was also done outside. Um, we cannot be sure, but I have actually counted, in the Cezanne exhibition I did years ago, counted the pin marks in Cezanne watercolors to see how many times they is were... Right? Is that right? And they were yeah. put on his board six, seven, eight times on different days, mm. working from nature. With the easel paintings, you can never be sure, but it looks constantly like it's painted in a state of such 
intense excitation mm. that it couldn't possibly be manufactured in the studio. And his obsession with his subject. Because if you see, if you look at the background, look at this landscape and then put it next to one of the bathers' landscapes in the big bathers in the National Gallery, yeah. there's a great difference. Yeah. There yeah. you really feel he's filling in contours. I have to say, I'm much, I was going to ask you about the bathers because this is the Cezanne that I, I also love. I mean, I find the, the bathers, I don't know, it's too bombastic somehow. Well... It's a picture before its time. It's a difficult picture. Um, and as Cezanne himself said, I am the primitive of the way that I have found. And that is his exact words in a letter to Gasquet in, in 1898. Um, and the bathers is tough. Um, but he's trying to do the impossible, to acknowledge on the one hand that he's working on a flat surface, and to create, on the other, the fact that he wants to achieve a sense of depth mm. and three-dimensionality. In still life and landscape. I mean, that's the other interesting thing. I mean, when you put the, you know, the two together, yeah. um, I mean, it's the same, essentially the same proposition. Yes. He's trying to, Cezanne's trying to do too much to reconcile, reconcile space and surface all the time. The vast majority of artists accept and have accepted the fact that they're decorating a flat surface, and that, but it must look like a three-dimensional world. And so they're all the time trying to accommodate one to the other. Mm -hmm. Cezanne is uh, wishing to reconcile and fuse the two so that um, individual strokes both exist on the surface and also in relation to other strokes and passages in the picture that are much further back. Mm. It's very tense, isn't it? It's very tense. This cascade of diagonals, the mountain, the branches of the tree, um, the curvature of the land behind, all of them sit at once two-dimensionally and yet, of course, are constantly pulling back and forward, pulsating in space too. It's a perfect... Uh, it's a perfect link to the next and the final work in this sequence. The work of <laughs> Paul Clay. Now, you're a world expert on Paul Clay. Maybe once, you wrote a book. Maybe once upon a time was. Um, that's the most. I well, how did you? How was it that you came? Oh, to that's easy. That's work very easy it. told um, through music. I, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I came to the history of art through music. I was studying music. My first degree is in music. And it's also in zoology. It's a double first degree. Um, and Clay was an expert violinist, and he was passionate about nature and animals. Mm -hmm. And they both come, they all come together in fish magic, um, which is an enchanted underwater landscape or seascape, whatever you want to call it, with a clown on the left who's just pulling back a curtain to reveal this undersea world of fishes, flowers, and figures, and hourglasses. This it takes us to where we began, with time. That's what this picture is really about. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a patch of fabric glued onto the center of it, a world within the world. Some plants grow from the base of the patch of fabric. The patch of fabric bisects the hourglass at the lower left. The fishes swim indiscriminately from one patch to the other. The curtain, though, is reflected in the patch in the center as though this is another and separate world. The moon and sun float freely in the center of the canvas. And right below and to the right of them is a church steeple on which there's a <coughs> clock. And that clock has its numerals designated. And four of them are red. 
and the others are not. And the four that are red are not 12, 3, 6, and 9, as you might expect. But they're 1, 9, 2, and 5, which is the year the picture was painted, 1925. The Trap of Time. It's a date painting. Like we were talking about and the before. figure on the lower right, bisected by the very patch of fabric, is Janus headed. Two faces, two hands, one waving, looking out towards the right, one waving carelessly and carefreely to the daisies in the hourglass vase to the right, the other looking in towards the clock face, drops his hand to his side, and all of a sudden seems to realize what the clock is really saying. Mm. That time is trapped, and man is trapped, and the fishes and flowers will go on forever and know nothing of their own individual destinies. Man, alas, forever will. It's a very profound painting as you describe it, and yet, of course, for many people that see this work, it will appear so, well, you know, quite a, quite a light thing and a decorative work. Well, yeah. enchanted, certainly. Mm. And Clay originally called it, he titled all his pictures, called it Large Fish Picture. And then he changed it to Fish Magic. But it was his largest picture to date, and it's a major masterpiece for him. He's not an artist appreciated in this country, and it's too late to collect him now. Mm. But he should have been. And you had this interest in music, and you had this interest in, uh, in zoology, and, and then you stumbled across this work where you were looking for a, an artist to suit you. How did it happen? I think I, when I decided to switch to the history of art, I must unconsciously or subconsciously have thought, how can I use what I already know? Mm -hmm. And I knew quite a lot of zoology. This doesn't require a lot, but some of the paintings by Clay do. And I knew a little bit about music, and you only have to look at this to feel that it looks like a musical, musical score. Mm -hmm. the, way the, the way the forms are dancingly dotted around it. It's, so, a, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful painting. And well, a, and a very nice conclusion, which is not the end, but to the uh, conclusion to this, this um, sequence. If you were going to take one to your desert island, says I, because you would remind me of how hard it all was. <laughs> Doing it, I mean. Um, and, th and that's what you want on the desert island? It would be rather harrowing. I would like... You don't want the fish uh, magic? No, I don't want... No, 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 no. You can go for a swim and... And I your own wouldn't fish want magic. the syndix or last many. Oh. I think the Grunewald would be too much. <laughs> but they'd, they'd all really be too much. But Cezanne would... Cezanne encapsulates not only the achievement but the struggle. And that's really what life is about for most of us. Well, on that note, I invite you now to ask Professor Verdi uh, any question that you might have. So, and there's a microphone coming in your direction. So, uh, this is not so much for magnification, but uh, or amplification, but so we get it on tape. Hello, Richard. Thank you very much for fascinating, fascinating talk. On the radio program, of course, uh, guests are invited to select a book as well as as well as music. Uh, you've talked about music. On your desert island, would you select one piece of music that you would accompany your, uh, your collection of paintings? Uh, Bach? I remember you when you were in my house once. The Schubert C major quintet, string oh, right. quintet. <laughs> That's an obvious choice. It's the most <laughs> chosen on desert island discs. Are you surprised by that? It doesn't matter, it's just 
that it would be fascinating to hear your desert island bit. I must say. Um, that's already been done. That is but you know, I done. think we'll get, you know, there'll be a few pop numbers in there as well, I'm sure. Uh, other questions? It, where is it? In the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Sorry. Yes, I apologize for not telling. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Richard Verdi, so much for such a wonderful, wonderful commentary.